Greetings everyone, welcome to another episode of The Professionals You Should Know. This show is about uncovering the journeys of professionals from different industries. And today, we have the outstanding and phenomenal Dr. Agatha Nortley Meshe, who is a general practitioner and assistant medical director for the London Ambulance Service. It's a pleasure having you here. Um, so, what is it that you do? Um, so, um, I'm, I am a GP mainly, mm -hmm. um, and I also work for London Ambulance Service as one of the assistant wow. medical directors. Wow, so what does that involve? What is that? <laughs> so, at the moment, my main role is um, leading and looking after our one on one services across okay. most of London. Um, and yeah, working with other providers, working with the wider system just to make sure that. We get the right care for patients That's across London. That's interesting. So how did you, what was your journey like? How did you become a, a GP and then how did you become to be in this role of um, looking after the 111 service? So um, how did I become a GP? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> what, was, what was your journey? Um, yeah, I mean, I suppose, yeah. I, um, so, something that you always wanted to do in life? Did you know you were always going to be one? Not really. Okay. No, I, I actually probably didn't want to be a doctor uh, to start with. Oh, that. really? Yeah, funnily enough. Okay. <laughs> um, no, I, I didn't, yeah, I don't, it, well, I did and I didn't. Um, mm. I'm one of four daughters and my dad is a GP. Oh, and really? okay. He, one of us had to be a GP, right. um, basically. <laughs> and um, I didn't. I didn't think I wanted to do it because it was almost like I didn't want to do something because somebody else said I should. Right, yeah. Um, so, but I had the grades and things to do it. Mm. Um, I took some time off before I went and did some um, black studies courses and oh, nice. just kind of learn about myself. Nice. Um, did a bit of music. I used to sing. So oh. I used to just explore everything else. And actually, it's, it's probably the black studies that um, and the kind of learning more about the the black experience in the UK and mm. reflecting on that, that made me realise that actually I did need to be a doctor okay. um, and you needed to have doctors with a particular mindset. Mm. Um, and so I kind of went back and did it, but I did it on my terms in that way. Yeah. Um, so nice. yeah, that's how kind of, that's how I got started medicine. Mm. Um, and then I think obviously medical school, you do different um different um, specialties, you get experience in different areas. Mm -hmm. um, I always liked primary care because I think right. you get to build a relationship with your patients in mm -hmm. a way that no other specialty probably mm -hmm. does. You see them from cradle to grave. Mm -hmm. you, it's not just um, a particular condition or a particular kind of um, group of conditions that you, you look after. Mm -hmm. it, you know, it, someone could come and see you, it could be about anything. Yeah. You've got no clue what you're going to have day to day. You've got to know enough about everything, yeah. um, but also enough to know what your limitations just, are. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I think that was partly why I picked general practice. Mm. And then um, I also had my children in medical school. Okay. Oh, so really? um, <laughs> yeah, I think I needed to, um, it was also practical in that, mm. um, not that general practice isn't busy. General practice is probably bu the busiest, one of the busiest specialties. Mm. But I think it's probably the one that allows you to have um, the flexibility of having a portfolio career so you can actually okay. you know work a couple of days here a couple of days in something else um probably more so than any of the other specialties mm. um so I think that yeah it, it kind of just fitted with everything that I was becoming really mm. so that's that's why general practice that's interesting and then how did you become to your second my current role, role. yeah um, so um, I was lucky enough when I did my GP training, I was lucky enough to to um, have a trainer who was also uh, at that point, we were kind of just GP federations were forming into consortia and then they were going to become CCG. So it was that kind of time where oh. primary care started to um become more involved in commissioning and my trainer was very much at the forefront of that um wow. and is quite a, a lead in the urgent care space and mm. in the commissioning space um and so for me I think early on it was it was a case of that I didn't really you know you, you can have impact on the patients that you see but that's mm. one patient at a time yeah or you can have impact on a whole system mm. and that's several patients at a time and you can improve things for everybody yeah. including the one in front of you mm. so I was always really interested in how things worked how the health service worked how to 
develop patient pathways, how to, you know, how to make things better on a wider scale than just maybe, I don't know, the 40, 50 patients that you might see on a day-to-day basis. Wow. GP. Oh yeah, this is what we do. And we're still doing it just to put that out there for everyone who thinks GPs aren't seeing patients. So, so that um, was that, 10 minutes of time or something? 10 minutes per appointment. Um, and now with the telephone and the video and things included, you are, you see a lot of people, you have a lot of contacts. But yeah, you know, it's, it's a lot, but it, you could do more. You know, I mean, mm. with my one-on-one services, we're looking at, several thousand patients a day that we support so wow. actually you know so I think that's kind of where I, I started going. so I started following my trainer around um, to meetings and things just every, things that he was do, doing as long as I'd done my homework and I'd, I'd completed my portfolio I was he was like yeah you can come with me to this you can come with me so I really um, got a bit of more an insight into mm. commissioning and into service design and all of that and realise that's what I wanted to do. Um, when I qualified, I took a year off and did a Darcy Fellowship and worked with NHS. So um, the, the Darcy Fellowships, they are um, they were designed... Um, they were actually, uh, when was it now? Oh, gosh, it's, well, it must be more than 10 years ago, really, wow. as a leadership um, fellowship, initially just for doctors. Um, okay. And obviously they're named after Lord Ara Darcy, who had a big vision for how care um, could be delivered across the UK um, and the importance of clinical leadership. Um, And so um, initially for doctors, but I was the first cohort where it was multidisciplinary. So we did have, you know, lots of different specialties in in my group, um, including physios, including (laughs) nurses, including paramedics. Um, And actually it was really, really good. And we all were kind of um, lent to um, a different NHS organisation, either be it a, a health authority or a CCG or actually a provider organisation to support some element of project work. But we also had to do a postgraduate certificate in clinical leadership at the same time. Okay. Um, so I did mine with NHS South West London, right. where um, we were um, reconfiguring the local healthcare landscape, which was really, really interesting. Okay. Um, and then... After that, I went on to take on a role with Croydon CCG as um, urgent care oh, clinical lead. Wow. Um, and so got more involved really in urgent care, um, urgent emergency care commissioning, um, cardiology commissioning, just kind of set, working with the providers to really look at how we could deliver care better in that area. Mm-hmm. Um, and then that, because of that, you kind of, and because of the Darcy Fellowship, I suppose you end up in different forums where obviously your your knowledge and expertise in your particular areas are useful and and can contribute to kind of wider change. So mm. um, it, it was actually in, in one of the kind of a pan London kind of urgent care type meeting where um, a very um, prominent GP who I have a lot of respect for mm-hmm. um, said, are you going to go for the ambulance job? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I was like, oh, what ambulance job? I wasn't really looking for a, a job at that point. Um, and she said, you know, if, if I was, you know, if I was your age and I was at your stage in your career, I would do it. Um, and I thought, you know what, if this individual firstly comes to me and thinks I can do it and, wa- and wonders why I'm not doing it. And mm. also if it's something she would do and she's someone, she's one of my role models really? um, that actually... I should have a look into it. So mm. I did and I applied for it and um, yeah, got the role and accepted it. And this is probably about six years ago now. I've been working wow. with London, the London Ambulance Service. So yeah, so it's, it's probably one of the best jobs I've done. I think being a commissioner is different from being a provider in okay. that, you know, when you're the provider, you can, you can make things happen. Right. Um, you can design it, you can co-design it with the, com- as, as a commissioner, but, when you're actually the one delivering the service, you're you're right on that forefront of of delivering it, and therefore yeah. you can actually you you've got the vision of what you want to achieve, but you can actually decide how that happens, yeah. um, and deliver it. So yeah, it's been really exciting um, wow. over the last few years, and yeah. So what's one of the stories? I know that was a really um, <laughs> amazing story that you know one of the, your role models was saying that you're able to do it. But is there any other story while in the role? Uh, make you kind of reinforce that yeah this is what I love to do um yeah I think so I oh, suppose sorry. yeah um that well, comes to mind. um I'm trying to think of if there's any particular stories mm. I think for me um one of the things that it highlighted for me was how little other bits of the system understand about ambulance services so when I joined yeah. Yeah. the ambulance service I realized that as a GP yeah I didn't know a lot. There was a lot I didn't know. Mm. And I'd been an urgent care lead in a CCG and I'd worked with 
people from the ambulance service and I'd worked with people from emergency departments and I'm, because I'm lucky enough as a GP to have worked in urgent care, to have worked in out of hours, to have worked in A&E, mm. to have worked in different specialties within hospital settings, to have worked with the community. So those areas I... I had, you know, I couldn't say I'm an expert in them. Of course, there's people that are experts in those areas. But I'd had experience in those areas. Mm. And I kind of felt I had an appreciation for the pressures that are faced by those areas, for the skill sets, um, mm. for the kind of scope of practice, what what they're capable of, what they're not, you know, how do you refer into them? Mm. What does it mean? What mm. impact do you have when you send the wrong patient in? You know, that kind of thing. Mm. For ambulances, I realised that we know nothing. And therefore, you kind of mm. think my goodness, like what, what could I have done better mm. if I had known more? Mm. Um, and so one of the things myself and actually one of my, because there was another GP assistant medical director at London Ambulance Service we worked together to do was to um, go around and encapsulate everything we had learned in our probably first six months to a year and go and teach that and share it to the world because actually we felt mm. that, you know, as GPs, we may not be utilising, in fact, not we may not, we are not utilising ambulance services as best as we could do yeah. to get the best outcomes for our patients. We don't mm. understand the the capabilities of what ambulance clinicians can and can't do. Um, and so sometimes that leads to um, issues with communication. Sometimes that leads to delays in patient care mm. um, or else. I mean, yeah, I think, and, and also I find that each bit of the system blames the other bit Mm. when it doesn't really get mm. the other bit. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, yeah, we started doing that. I think that was one of the first things. Um, we've kind of continued in that because even within um, our one-on-one services, this is the, f- you know, we've been running those for about um, three years now. Well, one-on-one we've been running for more than okay. that, sorry. Um, we've been running one-on-one in South East London since 2013. Okay. But in terms of its current function where you've got GPs, you've got um, pharmacists, right. you've got prescribing, you've got... It's a whole multidisciplinary team, again, of clinicians supporting the, the patients, as well as you've got the um, health advisors who are non-clinical but use the NHS pathways yeah. tool to assess. You've also got a, a whole remit of clinicians that sit behind them that support that add um you know provide additional and en- uh, enhanced assessment for patients mm. that can refer that can direct book and actually um the the it's almost like that that single point of access for patients mm. so and it can link into any bit of the system mm. in that way so i think mm. it, it's it's made that what's the word it's made that that shared understanding and that integration even more important um, it's made us able to make connections with all kinds of, you know, I mean, we're now talking about developing care pathways with secondary care with, mm. you know, there's things that we wouldn't have been able to do mm. previously. Um, so, yeah, I think, um, I don't even know if I've answered your question, I've gone off on a tangent. <laughs> um, but I think, um, I, I suppose for me, what it, it, one of the things is around, how it's about that relationship building with the wider system and I think ambulance services haven't really been in that space previously Mm. Um, people have designed whole systems and not thought about how the ambulance service or the one-on-one service would link into it now that that's changed Um, now that's really improved I think Covid had a lot to do with it as Mm. well um, in terms of the the um, the connections being made I think right. um, and yeah and those those collaborative projects kind of going forward so you know the 999 that we normally use for the ambulance service was the 111 created to take pressure off the 999 or no so 111 was um, so you're probably too young to remember yeah, no. <laughs> um, we used to have something called NHS Direct right, which yeah. was a pan UK service it mm. was a 0300 number I believe right. um, and it was a number that um, um, people used to um, call and you'd call and you'd be able to um, get some assessment and um, oh. be able to access care you know if you, you, you'd call and if they, they the person you spoke to be a uh, um, a call handler or a nurse would talk to you and, and agree where you, what you needed to do. And they might say you need to go to A&E or actually, no, that's absolutely fine. You can talk okay. to your GP about that. Um, and this was, um, you know, over a decade ago. And, and 111 was really an evolution of that. So what they wanted to do was make it a free number, um, make it an easy number, three-digit number. Um, and also the other thing that went 
kind of made one on one the next stage was um, a directory of services, which is a it's a um, national directory of services mm. that sits behind it. So before you could tell someone they need to go to A and E, but mm. you couldn't necessarily pull up which service was open, which was ava- available, which was inf- um, was yeah, which was available for them at that point okay. in time. The directory of services is live. So actually, if I want to refer someone to you yeah. and you're shut, you won't show up. You won't even show up as an option. It will only show you up where you're open. It will only show your service up where that patient actually matches it. So you might say, you know, I only see adults and I'm open Monday to Friday and they have to be within this particular catchment area. If the patient I'm speaking to doesn't fit your criteria, they will not, you will not show up as a service. So it literally matches what you've put into the system about the patient with what's available. Right. So, I mean, so that that was launched at the same time and that's one of the kind of um, jewels and the crown of one on one firstly the triage tool which again is a national tool it's not owned by us it's owned by NHS mm. digital um, but it's it's a very robust tool that allows that assessment to take place mm. and that decision making around what happens mm. and then you've got this director of services uh, and then probably around 2017-ish there was a th- next evolution of 111 which made it into integrated urgent care and that's where you now have not only um, the health advisors and your layer of mainly it was mainly nurses and paramedics that used to support them Mm. you now have your um, gps your pharmacists your advanced Mm. practitioners we now not only can search the directory but we can direct book so we can actually say not only is this service open but there is an appointment do you want me to book it for you um we can e-prescribe um, and as I said, we're now even building further pathways in. The other thing we can do is provide support and advice for clinicians out in the field. So, you know, um, paramedics on scene, care home staff, nurses mm. and care homes, community teams. So if someone's out with a patient in the community doing their normal assessment um, and they require additional support mm. or they need to speak to a GP for advice or they think actually, you know, this patient might have an infection, they need to prescribe them. Um, antibiotics you know they can ring in um, and then they'll get one of our gps to call them back and then we can sort that out and it's 24 7 so that's that's kind of how it's grown so yes it does protect 999 Mm. it protects a and e it protects Mm. everything because one of the key things is that we should really you know where it's safe to assess a patient and um, safe to manage that care in that episode Mm. because we can use video as well video consultation Mm. so if you're able to do that and manage that episode of care without needing to send them somewhere, yeah. you do that. Yeah. Um, if you do need mm. to send them somewhere, then you have the whole you know range of whatever's available. Mm. It has to be profiled on the directory, mm. <laughs> otherwise you can't see it. Yeah. But generally, so you know you can find alternative pathways for people if actually A and E isn't the right place. Right. You can look at other ways of getting the patient to where they need to go or, you know, actually, you know, when you call an ambulance, you're not calling an ambulance to take someone somewhere. Yeah. You're calling two healthcare professionals yeah. who are highly skilled in critical care mm. to come and attend your patient. Yeah. And, you know, they, it's not a transport service. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. Um, you, you know, we need to be very clear yeah. as to why we need that, that skill sense. set. Yeah. Do you see what I mean? If you, you, you know, so I think it, it's, yeah, so... In a way, that being able sense. to so when it, when one one does work very well, and of course all the clinicians that work for my one 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 services yeah. have also had my ambulance talks. They get they get it as well. Yeah. Um, it's really important that they understand what they're doing because mm. if you refer someone into a service that is already busy, you yeah. make that service more risky. Yeah. If we make A and E full, we make it very difficult for A and E to look after the sick people. Yeah. If we refer to too many ambulances we make it very difficult for the ambulance service to get to the sickest patients first yeah. because there's just such a big number of people. Mm. So it, it's, it's um, you know, we've got to think not, again, not just about the patient in front of us. We've got to think about the bigger system yeah. and think, actually, if we use the slots and the services properly, yeah. then we make sure that, you know, if my next patient was the one that needed the ambulance, they get it, get it. Yeah, because I didn't use sense. it up for the one that didn't need it before. And I think that's kind of how, yeah, that makes the big impact. So it, it kind of, it is the right, I think it, that's what makes me realise it's the right role for me, because yeah. my whole kind of um, ethos around the bigger system and thinking about all patients, not just them one by one, yeah. um, this really allows me to actually um, 
have impact on that. Mm, I don't, that Does that make it sense? Doesn't make complete sense. <laughs> Didn't think of it like that, but yeah, no, that, that's really. <laughs> really great what are you do you know you. i don't do it myself well <laughs> i just look team, after yeah. the people that do it um oh, and they amazing. are absolutely amazing absolutely yeah. amazing team of people um yeah that that deliver these services so then going on to it who do you think benefits the most uh, it could be like um you know patients the government who do you feel that benefits from your service the most Oh, the patients, absolutely. Patients. Absolutely. Yeah. It's, it's all about the patients. It's all about, and, and well, it's all about the patients, well, but you've got to, I think it's it's also all about our staff. You've got to look after your staff because mm. they will look after the patients by mm. virtue of being healthcare people. Mm. Um, you know, they, um, they, they always, they will give care. That's what they do. Mm. Um, so we kind of, you know, we need to make, and particularly this year, it's been really hard. Um, so imagine. there's been lots of kind of well-being um, processes that we've put in place to mm. support our people. But, Absolutely, it's about the patients mm. first and foremost. It's about making sure that you know people will dial one 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 and they should have dialed nine nine nine. People will right. dial nine nine nine, they should have dialed one one one. It shouldn't be for them to decide. What, yeah. You know, it should be whichever number your finger hits yeah. is fine. Yeah. You will get care. If yeah. you need an ambulance, you'll get an ambulance. If you need to be in A and E, we'll we'll kind of sort that out. We'll get mm. you um, let you know that's where you need to go. Mm. If you need an appointment, we'll sort that out. If you need a prescription, so I think it is really. Um, yeah, it's about getting the patient to the right... Well, getting them the right care, because they might mm. not even need to go anywhere. And I think a lot of people don't want to go anywhere at the current time yeah. as well. So yeah. you, you want to, you know... But if they do need to be somewhere, it's identifying that early mm. and um, getting them there, really. Yeah, no, the service is great, what you're doing. And your team. <laughs> is there any, like, misconception to um, your role or the ambulance service at all? Um, yeah, I mean, I think um, the, the paramedic profession is probably not as understood as yeah. other professions. Yeah. I think they don't necessarily get the respect that they deserve, as mm. you would do for doctors, nurses, you know, mm. other, other healthcare professionals. Mm. Um, oftentimes they're called ambulance drivers, mm. which is an insult. Mm. They, yes, they can drive the vehicle, <laughs> but as I said, these are highly trained critical care clinicians when mm. I go out or I used to I don't do so much because of COVID used to go out with my paramedic and non-paramedic colleagues not all people in green are paramedics either so oh. when I used to um yeah we have some um non-registrant clinicians um emergency oh. ambulance crew but again highly skilled individuals highly trained individuals very knowledgeable what they do mm. but you know you'd go, I'd go out and um there will be things that you know there's there's there are skills and procedures that they can carry out that I wouldn't even I can't do you know really? just because I'm a doctor we just have I think we each different types of clinicians have different skills but yeah. equally important skills yeah and we yeah. shouldn't be thinking that one is above or below the yeah, other it's good. really not good yeah, I but agree. I think where we understand other people's professions I think we don't really under the one the one area that we we probably the wider system really doesn't understand is that paramedic profession mm. um, and that's when I go out with them I mean that's you know they're amazing they mm. are probably the bravest and most um, what's the word resourceful mm. individuals teams I know I mean they will we all have a clinical space to work from yeah. literally you go to work you know your, your yeah, couch yeah. is here <laughs> yeah. they will go to someone yeah. who is in their bathroom stuck between you know the toilet and the sink yeah. and or then go somewhere and they're outside um you know and they have to yeah. create a clinical space they have to they have to reimagine a clinical space they have to make sure that a patient has dignity they need to provide care in some of the most unusual mm. circumstances they then need to work out how if they are taking this patient to hospital how to get them ready and then how to get them transported mm. and then where to you know so they don't they also like me don't know what's coming mm. you know they can you can go to you don't you can go on a shift and you have, have absolutely no idea you can deliver a baby do oh, yeah. uh, uh, advanced life support wow. help an elderly frail person off the floor um you know you, you can within the same shift all of that can happen wow. you've got no idea and then in between you've got to somehow reset yourself and get ready for the next person and yeah. give them care as if they were the first person you saw yeah without knowing that what you last saw was really traumatic yeah. so i think there's there's them i think the other people that are really 
misunderstood are our call handlers in 111 and 999. Okay. Because again, these are also very highly trained people. They might not be clinicians, they mm-hmm. might not be doctors and nurses, they might not, but, but actually what they, they do is they, they are the first point of call for mm. people who are usually really worried, mm. really scared, really distressed, in pain, mm. angry, mm. Um, people who've just lost a loved one. And they can hold that person in that moment. They can conduct a very thorough clinical assessment using the tools they've been given. They also deliver babies over the phone. Really? They all, yeah, in 111 and in 999. Oh. They also provide cardiac arrest um, CPR instructions to bystanders over the phone. Wow. Um, so, you know, they save lives. Yeah. You know, sometimes, you know, we come in the doctor's nurse <laughs> and get all the pregnant. Yeah. But actually, without the people that yeah, answered the phone in the first seen. place and got the help in the first place, you know, we wouldn't know. So it's that whole system from the moment that person picks up the phone to whenever they get to the end point of their care. Yeah. Everybody along that journey is important. And I think the only other thing as well, sorry, got me started on people <laughs> that don't get recognised, is the people behind the scenes. Yeah. You know, yeah. to have that vehicle running, yeah. you need vehicle prep people. Yeah. You need oh, yeah. um, logistics people mm. to sort out, to make sure the medicines and things are packaged properly. You mm. need, you know, all, all the supporting functions within a trust, mm. the HR, finance, you know, all of those. Mm. We don't think actually, it, it's they, without all those departments, you cannot deliver a service and mm. you won't get that clinician to that mm. patient the clinician is the end point mm. the person who finally lays hands on the patient is the end point yeah. there's so much before them the training you know mm. all of that that has to happen and uh, there's whole departments that do that mm. and they don't get credit either mm. so i think um i think yeah i suppose it's it's about um us understanding when we say thank you NHS and we we know actually how big that is yeah. you know the porters who take the patients yeah. to the theatre yeah. the, the clinic well. you know, yeah. that is yeah. the NHS everybody in there is NHS not just us doctors mm. you know and I think that's something we don't talk about enough so yeah those are the probably the misconceptions about healthcare no, I completely agree with you completely 100% I think yeah all right, so what we're going to do now, we're just going to move on to uh, um, the next uh, stage. So it's just a few questions that I'm going to ask you. Okay. So it's going to be, it's, we call it rapid fire. So oh, it's dear. Like, okay. no, no. <laughs> I better take so it. So it's either, going to be, it's either going to be a yes or no, mm-hmm. or pick a choice. All right. What's pick a choice? Oh, pick a choice pick of a choice. the things. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, so for our first question, um, which call is made more? 111 or 999? One one one. Oh, really? Mhm. Just you know, Okay. There are more one 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 calls. Really, by a substantial amount. Mhm. Oh, okay, cool. Across London, if you think one nine 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 is across London, um, on average, it's probably about, well, it should be about five thousand calls per day. Um, oh. at currently, we're sometimes seven thousand calls a day. At the height of COVID, it was eight, nine, ten thousand. Wow. But with one 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 you'll probably get about 3,000 per day per bit of London. Wow. So North East London, for example, and in the weekends it's higher, um, North East London or South East London, for example. So if you add up all the bits of London all together, oh, and at the height of wow. COVID, again, it was twice, three times as much, I think. It wow. last, last um, We had three, yeah, three times the volume of calls. Um, so again, you were taking 8,000, 9,000 per bit of London. So you have to add all the bits of London. So that's why I say that it's, each call centre might be different, but when you put it all together, um, it is more, there's more people calling 111, which is actually how it should be, because 999 yeah. is emergency, emergency only. and 111 is urgent care. Cool. And you'd expect, hopefully, that people have, these serious emergencies should be fewer. Cool. Okay, cool. Right, so uh, for our second question... All right, in your opinion, yes. Which musculoskeletal injury mm-hmm. is most likely to result in sick days? Knee pain or shoulder pain? Oh, hmm. interesting. Yeah, I know, right? <laughs> you probably know this more than me. No, no, I don't, I don't um, at all. Knee pain or shoulder pain? Hmm. Hmm. I, I, I don't know. know. It's, it's, it's in I your opinion. Know. I don't know. Um, There's no I'm just trying to think as a GP, like who I see more. Yeah. Probably shoulder pain. Okay. Okay. Cool. Probably shoulder pain. I think. Alright. Um, particularly if it's their dominant arm. Okay. Shoulder pain. Cool. Alright. I'm guessing. Yeah, no, that's cool. <laughs> so, well, third and final question. Alright. 
So has any, uh, have you or any of your staff been in an accident on the way to an accident or like a 999 call? Um, I, yes, I guess we have. I think oh. the, what I would say, I mean, driving on blue lights is not easy. Hence, yeah. It's a big, long course that people have to go on to. Really? Give, oh, yeah. It's a, I think it's six weeks. Don't quote me on that. But it's a long oh. course that you have to do, already having been, obviously, a proficient driver, to be able to do a blue light course. Um, I am not a blue light driver. <laughs> okay. um, but what I would say, it's, it's, it's dangerous, which is the other thing as well, in terms of when people, when we call ambulances, you know, it, it, of course, we must call them appropriately and for, you know, when we need help. But actually considering that, it, it is dangerous to drive on blue lights. And yeah. so we need to also consider that someone's going to be doing that to get to us. Um, the other thing also is other drivers on the road. Ah. Um, other drivers on the road um, knowing what to do when they've got blue lights coming towards them. And I think sometimes people panic. Yeah. And people don't know yeah. how to support themselves. <laughs> or even people that are crossing the road. I, I don't understand, <laughs> but people feel they should run past. And it's, it's not, you know. So I think, um, you, know, in, you know, it's important to, um, I think, be aware. I mean, they're, they're, they're very highly skilled. They're very good at it. And yeah. they're very, part of the being able to drive on blue lights is being conscientious about who else is on the road. So they don't, you know, they, they're they very, very careful. Mm. But it is it is dangerous. It's a mm. different way of driving. You're, you're using routes and roads that you may not normally use. Um, you're having to manoeuvre around vehicles in a way yeah. that you wouldn't normally have to do. Um, and you're probably going at a speed that you wouldn't normally be going yeah. at. So... I think it's more. It's also about how us as other drivers can uh, and pedestrian pedestrians can ensure that we ensure that it's safe because that ambulance is on its way to someone who's very sick, mm. uh, or they're transporting someone who's very sick mm. to hospital, um, and we need to make way. Mm. Um, we need to do it in a way that we don't put ourselves in danger, other yeah. people in danger. Yeah. If at the best, just slow down and kind of edge. To the side so that they can get past you right. they will they will work it out but just slow down but you know i think where yeah sometimes it can be very difficult wow does that answer the question i think you said yes yeah <laughs> so yeah it does. <laughs> all right so for our final kind of questions so in your opinion where do you feel the healthcare industry will be without your profession as a gp and as a you know medical director directing the 111 service where do you think the healthcare industry would be without, be without you guys. Um, well, you just up upgraded me. I'm an assistant medical director. <laughs> <laughs> I, like, I don't mind the upgrade. Um, so where would it be without? I mean, I think without GPs, I mean, you know, GPs are the, I don't know how to put us. I mean, we're, we're very important. Yeah, um, yeah of course. I mean, we are the first point of contact mm. for most people around healthcare. Mm. Um, and we kind of hold... The, the, I said from the patient from, from start to finish, the whole life journey, the, their medical records sit with us generally. We have access to refer them into any bit of the system generally. So I think, I don't, I don't think the NHS could exist without primary care. Mm. I think, um, you know, it, it I, well, it probably could. I, I can't, I don't understand, I don't know how it would happen, but it probably could. But I think, um, yeah, primary care is, is central to mm. the NHS and, um, the care that is provided um, in primary care, and uh, again, uh, that's not just the GPs. That's all, mm. you know, all our staff in primary care mm. um, is absolutely essential. So I can't see that happening. I think, um, in terms of my role in in London Ambulance Service, mm. um, I think it's not about my role. It's about the services that I look after and yeah. the services that are delivered. I think the one on one service and the nine 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 service are also you know, in in their uh, different arenas, mm. also essential services within the NHS. Mm. There needs to be, because the healthcare system is so complex, it's almost like having a single point of access for people to mm. uh, to be able to access care if they're worried about something, even if it's nothing, you know, it, it's something that maybe they need advice on. Mm. So actually, they've just been given some new tablets and they didn't really, they forgot to ask if they could take it with their current ones. They don't mm. know what to do or they've had some if problem and they think, oh, is it a side effect? Or, mm. you know, um, actually, they can call or they can go online because there's mm. one on one online, but they can, um, then they can, they can have an assessment if they're not sure if their symptoms are serious or they're not sure what to do. Should they go to A&E? Should they not? 
they get that assessment and that assessment helps to mm. make that decision and get them to where they need to be. Same thing with the 999 service. You know, you need a service that can, again, assess people, pick out the people that are really sick and get care to them immediately. Mm. And that care, as I said, it's not care that we're using to take them somewhere initially. Mm. It's care that we're sending to them yeah. to treat them on scene mm. at that time, to give them oxygen, mm. to, you know, all the things that we need to do at that time um, and start the treatment process, start the assessment process with them. Mm. And then if we then need to, to get them somewhere where they can get that definitive care. Mm. Um, and I think all three of those services are absolutely key um, and I, I, I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't know how we would survive without them. Mm. Um, and that's not to put down the rest of the no, NHS of at all. I think obviously community services, hospitals, every bit of the NHS has its part to play in mm. the whole patient journey. Mm. And we couldn't do one bit without the other. Mm. What we need to do is have some mutual respect and some mutual understanding of all those different bits mm. so that we can we can work fluidly and each bit can do the bit it's really good at. Yeah. But we yeah. can actually make sure that there's not repetition. There's yeah. not, you know, people being sent to the wrong place. Mm. There's not me doing something and then sending them to you and you do the same thing. Mm. You know, it's all of those things. And that it's about how we work together to streamline that. Mm. Um, and we don't blame each other for how busy we are yeah or make yeah. things difficult for each other because we're busy, busy yeah. it's about understanding everyone's busy yeah. and everyone's trying to do their best um and best. linking it together yeah no yeah 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 very well said very, very, very well said <laughs> thank you uh, and then do you see um you know the gp role or your assistant medical director role you got it right <laughs> Ch- <laughs> changing in any way um i don't know more status some people say better work life balance or um more in government is there any way of it kind of progressing in the sense you mean me more, personally or yeah, the role both or like technology that's been used as well like um i think General practice has transformed significantly already in the last 18 months mm. um, oh. in terms of what, you know, technology is just <laughs> things that we didn't think were possible, we're yeah. doing. So I think it will continue to evolve mm. and it will, it will yeah, continue to evolve in, in terms of what's available to us mm. to be able to deliver care. So, you know, if you'd asked me two years ago, we'd be doing, you know, majority telephone and video mm. consultation and that's transformed things for people. Yeah. Um, you know, I've got patients who you know, have mobility problems or, you know, disabled children and mm. they're like to come into the surgery is is they have to plan how they're gonna yeah. do that. And actually I can consult with you on a video. If the child has a rash, I can look at it, I can give assurance. If I need to ask someone to come in, I can book them in to come and see me. But actually it's increased access because mm. I can actually probably have more impact on more people rather than have a waiting room full of people. So yeah. I think yeah. that's transformed any anyway. But Absolutely. I mean, technology is just, you know, it's continuing to evolve, isn't it? So I think we will continue to evolve with it. Mm. And so will primary care, so will secondary care, so will mm. ambulance services, so will one-on-one services mm. um, start to, well, move forward. I mean, one one's always been very digital. It's always been remote assessment. It's always been telephone. It's video, uh, which also kind of I would say accelerated over the last year, but even having the referral pathways, even being able to refer someone into ambulatory care or same day emergency care, things like that, being able to access um, advice and support so we can support clinicians, as I said, on the field with the patient. Mm. What if I could then access a specialist mm. in a in a specialist centre who could then through me, you know, maybe it's uh, as a generalist, I need addi- additional support. I could then link in. Mm. So there's so much we can do already but i think yeah we will continue to um to evolve i think mm, definitely so for our last question mm-hmm. um do you feel that there's anything missing in your profession Ooh, interesting question mm-hmm. um no I okay don't. no i don't so everything's there work life because i know some people say work life ba- balance it could be um uh, i don't know status respect um it could be salary it could be so many different things so yeah. everything is no i think everything is is as it should be i mean if mm-hmm. i had to pick one i'd probably say work life balance yeah. but i think that is because of the nature of 
left where we are right now. Yeah. Um, and when you are running a 24-7 service, yeah. these things happen. But I think we're not in normal times and we haven't been in normal times for two years. Mm. Um, so... Yeah, I'm tired. I think everyone's tired. <laughs> everyone's knackered. The whole workforce is knackered. So yeah. Trying to find energy to keep going. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think that's probably the only thing. And I think mm. when it comes to work-life balance as well, some of that is within our gift as individuals to try and keep ourselves healthy as well. Mm. So, um, you know, we have to take, I have to take responsibility for yeah. that. Yeah. So I can't blame the job for it. I yeah. need to, you know, if you're, tired you need to take a break you need mm. to make sure you take your leave yeah. if you're not working on a weekend you need to switch off your phone and not look at your emails <laughs> yeah. it's just it is what it is but it is hard when yeah. it's a 24 7 service and things are happening I mean, something could be happening right now mm. um and i don't know and it's mm. like oh my god what's happening are mm. they okay so i think um yeah i think that's probably the only thing but i think just in terms of um yeah fulfillment and mm. you know where where i want to be in my career and all of that yeah, yeah i think i'm in mean, absolutely the right place this is probably well not probably this is definitely the best job i've ever had wow. and it's exactly do it's doing what i love yeah. and it's doing what i need to do and it's having the impact on people and care on as i said thousands of people mm. across london and yeah that's amazing mm. to be part of that Mm. Okay, well, um, yeah, it's been an absolute pleasure having you on the show. I learned so much. Um, I really appreciate it. For our final question, so as you know, the, uh, the show is called The Professional You Should Know. Is there any other professionals you think that we all should know? Oh, uh, oh recommendations. Yeah, yeah, just one. Just one. Um, just, just one. Just one. <laughs> just one. Um, so my sister. Oh, the right person. Okay. What she do? <laughs> She's a um, TV producer. <gasps> okay. Okay. <laughs> All right. Look yes. up the surname, you'll find her. Okay. Cool. Yeah, I think yeah, as a different good. profession, a non healthcare profession. Yeah. And someone who's really making strides in what she's doing. Mm. Sheila Notley. Perfect. I'm gonna, I'm gonna reach out to, her. I'm gonna reach out to. Her. <laughs> okay, but as I said, it's been an absolute honor to have you on the show, and um, uh, thank you for joining. Thank and you. Thanks for having me. Thank you for saying the truth.